Hey friends, welcome back to the Tune Apologetics. Super pumped you join us today to have the Chad McIntosh. We're going to be talking about idealism and common sense. So Chad, what's up, man? How you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing, Zach? I'm good. I'm super pumped. And as you we were saying right before this, I always love thinking about idealism. And some days I'm like, idealism is crazy. And other days I think it's true. And yeah, I'm just super pumped for this conversation. So it should be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I feel the same way. You know, it's like, it, like you said earlier, it depends on how I, not only what day I wake up, but on what side of the bed I wake up. <laughs> <laughs> if I like face the wall, I'm like, oh yeah, definitely idealism because everything's the same. But then I look at the other side with my whole room and I'm, there's like so many different things. And I'm like, is this all mm -hmm. just like conscious stuff? So mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. it just depends. So today we're going to be talking about your paper on idealism and common sense. In case you don't know, Chad's a philosopher and he's done a bunch of work, including like creating like egregiously long lists of arguments for the existence of God. Um, so just done a lot of really fun things. So Chad, anything you want to say before we dive right into this? No, just uh, thanks again for having me on. I always have a blast. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm super pumped. So to start things off, let's just talk about um, broadly the idea of like what idealism is. So broadly speaking, Chad, what would you say, how would you define idealism? You know, that's a, that's a super hard question because there are about as many idealisms as there are people who have called themselves idealists. <laughs> Everyone's mm -hmm. definition of idealism seems to differ. But uh, it, it, well, first of all, we obviously don't mean idealist in the popular sense of uh, well, like when you say, you would say something like, oh, you're such an idealist. You know, it's like someone yeah. who's given to like utopian visions or something like that. No, we're talking about a philosophical view about the ultimate nature of reality. And mm -hmm. in the broadest sense, I think all idealists agree that nothing exists without mentality or mind nothing exists with without mentality or, or mind and by and by those I, I just mean uh something that's intrinsically minded or mind like like ideas or consciousness or experience uh all these things that are mental or characteristic of of, of mentality so in the broadest sense uh there's nothing that's not uh there's nothing that exists without mentality or mind either because there's nothing that is not mental uh, or mind-like, or because the non-mental reality, physical reality, depends in some way on the mental. Uh, so the the mind or the mental reality is the fund more fundamental of the two, uh, the mental and the physical. So mm -hmm. that's the broadest characterization, I think, of of idealism. That kind of it's a it's a big enough net where it catches uh, everyone who would describe themselves as an idealist. Mm -hmm. That's super helpful. One thing, and correct me like if I, if I go wary or stray here, um, but one thing that helped me with understanding idealism is the idea that like say that like we have like we just think about in existence like all the minds, all the conscious stuff that exists. Um, under idealism, we take out all the consciousness, all that stuff, and there's nothing left because um, in some sense like everything's like either conscious or like the product of consciousness or something along these lines. Is there? How would you feel about like that explaining idealism in that kind of way? So if we took out all of the non-conscious stuff all we're left with is like the conscious stuff that's what idealism is is that what you're saying well what i would what i'm thinking is the idea that like so we have like everything that exists um just thinking about like the big blob of everything then within that big blob of everything everything is like either a mind or like yeah. dependent on a mind or like okay. in some sense maybe like resembles a mind so yeah. if all the minds are like things that are resembling minds are gone, there's nothing left. Um, so like an ah. idealism, everything's like the mind or like some, in some sense um, is going to resemble a mind. It's going to get tricky there. I think. I think that's roughly the idea. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's okay. roughly the, the idea. I think when we, when we get to talking about dualistic idealism, there might be some people who would want to quibble with that, but I think that's roughly the idea. Either, either nothing exists without a mind. Or uh, if something does exist, if something is if something is non mind like, if something's just merely material or physical, then it ultimately depends on something that is mind like or or conscious or something like that. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, yeah, that's great. Um, so maybe then the next thing, um, which is kind of helpful to know, is like what is common sense? We throw this around a lot, but like when we're looking at like the paper um, and things like this, like when we're like saying something that's like common sense, what are we trying to get at here? Yeah, also a hard question because, again, philosophers define it differently. But there is there is a common core, I think, to most characterizations of common sense. Uh, but it, it would be, be helpful to begin by talking a little bit about what 
philosophers don't mean when they talk about common sense or common sense philosophy. Uh, mm -hmm. They're not talking about practical or moral imperatives like don't spit into the wind okay. or look both ways before crossing the street. Or uh, one of my favorites is uh, don't cook bacon in the nude. <laughs> right? uh, treat treat others like you would want to be treated. Uh, or another another good one is um, don't ask a stranger when she's due. You know, that's, <laughs> that's uh, you know, I actually had that one uh, happen in, in my church years ago. This old witty guy, uh, first time visitor in the church. He went up to her and asked her when she's due. Apparently he thought she was pregnant. She wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Uh, but we're also not talking about uh, merely sensible th things, sensible beliefs that are common. Things mm -hmm. like uh, men are stronger than women. Uh, or you can't change the past. Or the earth is round. You know, these are these are common beliefs that are sensible, but they're not common sense beliefs by philosopher's lights. Uh, philosophers have something else in mind when they refer to common sense beliefs. So to get a handle on what they mean, uh, there's no better place to look than the most famous common sense philosophers themselves, which is Thomas Reed, 19th century philosopher, Scottish philosopher, and G.E. Moore, a 20th century uh, English philosopher. And they both have a bunch of examples of common sense beliefs. And, and here are some that I just kind of plucked out of out of their writings. It says, uh, I exist and have a body. Yeah, that's a belief I have. Uh, I, I would imagine most people have that belief. Uh, the mm -hmm. thoughts of which I am conscious are my own. They're not anyone else's thoughts. Uh, I, what I distinctly remember actually happened. Uh, I'm the same person over the course of my whole life. It's not like uh, there are multiple persons that exist within this body. Uh, what I perceive by my senses really exists and is roughly as I perceive it to be. So our, our senses are generally reliable. Hmm. I have some degree of power or control over my actions. You know, I can raise my arm. I can lower my arm at, at command, at will. Other people like me exist. Material objects exist space and time are real and so on so these these are very very basic beliefs they're not yeah. witticisms they're not imperatives they're not you know like little nuggets of wisdom or anything like that uh and in fact they're it's they're not even anything you learn by inference or deduction mm -hmm. uh, as reed says uh they, they're things that are no sooner understood than they are believed they seem self-evidently true uh, so we just find ourselves believing them. They're just givens, uh, almost even too obvious, obvious to state. So I think a, a fair characterization of what philosophers mean by common sense beliefs are beliefs that are deeply held and widely held, and they're mostly tacit. They're, they're mostly just kind of under the surface, too obvious to even state. They're taken to be a, ma a matter of common knowledge. And they're formed naturally and unreflectively via our own properly functioning faculties. I think I think that's a a pretty fair characterization of what most philosophers mean by common sense beliefs. Yeah, that's super helpful, and I really like the idea of like the self evident beliefs. Um, like something that helps me sometimes when I think about these issues is like. I think about like what did Zach believe when he was in high school, um, when like he was a freshman, sophomore, junior, um, before we started thinking about these topics, like certain things, like like my own existence or like the reliability of my memory. Like I never doubted these things. I was like, yeah, they're like duh, these things. Of course they exist. So I like the really the criteria of self evident is me super important. So how are these going to apply then when we go into like evaluating idealism, Chad? Yeah, so it's going to depend on what idealism we are going to be taking up. And so idealism, if you recall, is just the view that nothing exists without mentality or mind, either because there is nothing without ment without mentality or mind yeah. or because non-mental reality ultimately depends on the mental reality. So from mm -hmm. here, we can distinguish three main varieties of idealism and ask if they violate common sense as we just characterized it. So that's, mm -hmm. I think, what that's what I do. It's kind of a systematic approach to see if there is a version of idealism that's incompatible 
with common sense. Uh, because as as you said, if there are days when you feel attracted to a version of idealism. I, I, I am as well. But I'm also attracted to common sense philosophy. I, I take common sense to be sort of a rule of thumb in the way I approach uh, most matters philosophical. And so I have my I have this uh, conundrum sometimes where I'm like, well, I, I, I'm a big proponent of common sense philosophy. But at the same time, I find myself attracted to certain kinds of idealism. Is there a conflict here? Is there a conflict? So that was kind of, that's kind of the motivation for writing this paper is like, I, I want to get to the bottom of this to see if there is there really is a conflict here. Well, it's going to depend on what version of idealism is at stake. Yeah, right on. So let's look at these like three versions then. So the first one that you talked about is absolute idealism. So did you want to talk about like what it is and then like, do you think it does conflict with common sense? Yeah. So in this absolute idealism is what you might think of when you first hear the term I idealism. It's, it's a very radical view according to which there's just one immaterial mental thing, a mind or consciousness or a spiritual substance or something like that, and nothing else. So the appearance that there are non-mental material objects or anything other than this one immaterial mind is just an illusion. All is one, and this one thing is mental. So this, this version of idealism has a long history in both Eastern thought and Western thought, but at least in analytic circles, it's most closely associated with the German idealists like Hegel and Schopenhauer and their English counterparts uh, like uh, F.H. Bradley and John McTaggart. So mm -hmm. does this view, the view that there's just one immaterial thing, a mind, nothing else, that's it, does that conflict with common sense? Well, what do you think, Zach? <laughs> I mean, I've never actually believed that exists, so obviously. But no, no, <laughs> I've obviously had the same. No, I've had this very same intuitions. Like there's obviously more than existence than like the absolute mind. So it goes against my basic intuitions. Yeah, it seems like it's a pretty straightforward violation of, of common sense. You know, it's the denial, straightforward denial of the reality of appearances, including the reality of time, space, matter. Uh, the distinction between you and other minds, the, any distinctions of any kind. So as I say, this is a pretty radical version of idealism that when you read the proponents of this view, they actually flaunt this. They, they actually like ingest, they, they, they like the fact that it's so flagrantly contradictory to the hoi polloi, to what like most people believe. Mm -hmm. And so they, they relish in the fact that it, it's conflicting with common sense. Kind of reminds me of like my friends. Um, they, they, they joined like an intramural basketball league at my university. And like their goal was like to be the opposite of basketball. They got kicked out of the league Um, because their goal was to be like to play the opposite of basketball. Like they were like all wearing like Converse and like high top, like short shorts and just like <laughs> all, all kinds. They're just like trying to stand out as much as possible and be like, uh -huh. hey, look at us. We're not even like trying to make sense. Um, and it seems like to me, like absolute idealism, I thought of that because like, it's a little bit like that when you talk about these people that are like, yeah, we have this idea. Um, you don't exist. I don't exist. This idea doesn't really exist either. I guess if you're going to follow it all the way through and it's just like, it seems just to go against everything, um, that we kind of think about when we're thinking about the world. It really does. And there's this great passage in Bertrand Russell's autobiography when he, when he's talking about how he used to believe in this version of idealism and and he talks about how he was talked out of this version of idealism or he's argued out of it by G.E. Moore. And mm -hmm. uh, if I could just pull up this great quote, um, he says, uh, Bradley had argued that everything that common sense believes is mere appearance. We reverted to the opposite extreme and thought that everything is real that common sense uninfluenced by philosophy or theology supposes real with a sense of escaping from prison we allowed ourselves to think that grass is green that the sun and stars would exist if no one was aware of them and also that there is a plural, plural pluralistic timeless world of platonic ideas the world which had been thin and logical under idealism suddenly became rich and varied and solid so it's this idea of him being emancipated from the the prison of absolute idealism and, and all of its uh, esoteric arguments. 
<laughs> so we talked about absolute ideals. This is the idea that like there's just like one thing and it's like just the mind and there's nothing mm -hmm. really distinct from that mind. Um, so the next thing is Berkeleyan idealism. So like what is Berkeleyan idealism and how do you think it bears when looking at the idea of common sense? Yeah, so this is named after the 18th century Irish philosopher and bishop, George Berkeley. Berkeley argued that all reality consists of only minds and their ideas, but minds and their ideas make up the world as, as we know it. So he's not denying the reality of appearances. He's just saying things that uh, he's just saying things like tables, trees, apples, and so on are, are just collections of ideas. They're just a bundle of, of what he calls sensible qualities. So before we talk about whether this view conflicts with common sense, now I want to mention a popular misconception of Berkeley's view. Uh, and for, for better or worse, Berkeley summarized or encapsulated his, his view with this pithy, pithy phrase, you probably heard it, essay est percepi. To be is to be perceived. And in graduate school, uh, I took a seminar. Uh, what was the class on? may have been on Augustine or something like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I sat next to a guy, never knew him, but uh, he had a, a big tattoo on his arm that said, essay est per kepi. <laughs> so he might, you know, I might have been sitting next to him. And I, I don't know. Uh, so uh, to be is to be perceived. This, this, has, uh, this idea has led to many people to dismiss Berkeley's view as a kind of radical, anti-realist, subjectivist view. You, mm -hmm. I mean, you've you've probably heard the old canard, you know, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's no one's around to hear it, does it make a noise? You know, this mm -hmm. is like what's the hand of like what? You know, what's the sound of one hand clapping? That kind of thing. Uh, well, yeah. on this very bad interpretation of Berkeley's view, not only does the tree make no noise, the tree doesn't even exist. So clearly, clearly, that's that's absurd, and and I would say. A flagrant co contradiction uh or fl flagrant conflict with common sense um mm -hmm. but if to be is to be perceived as berkeley says how can we avoid this absurdity how can we avoid this sort of radical anti-realist subjectivist absurdity well the simple answer is that berkeley gave god god's mm -hmm. mind and ideas are what constitute the objective world of objects common to our perceptions and so things can exist even when you or I don't perceive them because God perceives them. There's nothing that God doesn't perceive. So God's perceptions constitute the objective world outside of our own minds. So that's how Berkeley's idealism doesn't collapse into this sort of absurd uh, anti-realist subjectivism. Mm. Um, so, so what do you I think mean, then? Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to ask you what you thought, Chad. Like, do you think there's teeth to Berkeley and idealism? Like, do you think it could be true or is it kind of like, oh, it's a fun idea, but... Mm. I do. Uh, let's let's come. Let's circle back to that. I want to okay. I want to circle back to that because I want to give I want to give Berkeley a little bit more run for his money here. So now that <laughs> we've got this mis mis misconceived view of of Berkeley's idealism out of the way, uh, let's talk about what his view really is and see if it conflicts with common sense. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I mean, it's interesting. You know, because he's he he invokes God, he 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 brings in theism to save his view from absurdity, um, and it's interesting because a lot of philosophers like Berkeley's arguments for idealism, but they don't like his theism. Uh, mm -hmm. But without his theism, it's absurd uh, and obviously in conflict with common sense. So, setting aside that misconception, whether Berkeley and idealism conflicts with common sense is going to come down to the status of matter, material objects in Berkeley's ontology. And, mm -hmm. and here too, unfortunately, Berkeley's view has been sort of the, the butt of a straw man, butt of jokes uh, and, and other misconceptions. So you you've, may have heard of the anecdote where a man boasted of refuting the whole of Berkeley's philosophy by going outside and kicking a stone and says, I refute it <laughs> thus. <laughs> so it's one of the- I had someone more... tell me that once when I was talking about idealism with <laughs> them. Yeah, this yeah. it's like I said, it's one of the most famous anecdotes in philosophy. Well, this comes in in response to I don't know if it's true or not, but it's one of these anecdotes where, oh, you want to refute Berkeley, just go kick a stone, you know. <laughs> but so if Berkeley thought that there are no such things as stones to kick, then yeah, of course there would be a conflict with common sense. But 
Did he? Did he deny the reality of things like stones? No, he did not. His main point, Berkeley's main point, was just that there's nothing beneath an object's sensible qualities, like its color, its size, shape, texture, and so on. There's nothing underneath those sensible qualities that exists independently of perceivers. So those things, when you go outside, when you look at a rock, a tree, a chair, whatever, they are exactly as you perceive them to be because they are nothing but their perceived qualities. Stones exist. Some are large, some are small, some are rough, some are smooth, some are gray, uh, some are cold, some are warm, and all of them, I imagine, are hard if you kick them. So there's just It's just that there's mm -hmm. nothing more to them besides these sort of sensible qualities. Now, whether or not Berkeley's answer to what a material object is fundamentally, and he says it's just a collection or a bundle of sensible qualities, whether that conflicts with common sense is not really the question. The yeah. question is whether he denies the reality of these objects as we perceive them, and he obviously doesn't. So I'm going to just throw in with Berkeley and say, no, his view doesn't really conflict with common sense. Mm -hmm. One question about perception is, so like, for example, like I can go, like I can look at these trees right outside my window right there, over there on the right, um, and there's some pretty big trees over there. And what if I like say, like, oh, I perceive this really just like this thin piece of like cardboard and try to go kick it. Obviously, if I do that, not going to end up too well for me. Going to get a broken toe. Nice visit to the ER, maybe. Um, so, like, what what exactly is the perception that we're looking at here? Because it seems like there's something, at least something mind independent, and at least in how we like, um, like, I can't just like change the way the tree is just by like thinking about it differently. Well, remember that aspect of Berkeley's view that a lot of people forget, which is the theistic aspect of it. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah, so they they are going to be different. Mm -hmm. And distinct from your perceptions uh yeah it's gonna it's gonna hurt if you go and kick that tree uh because that tree does not depend on just your perceivable qualities or, or the qualities that you mm. perceive that's that's going to be a tree that's sustained say in the mind of god yeah yeah okay uh, now yeah. The, yeah, that's great the interesting thing is that when it when it comes to this theoretical question of what material objects fundamentally are no one has an answer that would count as a common sense belief. I mean, mm -hmm. when you think about it, st stripped of all sensible or perceivable qualities of an object, what's left? Well, yeah. Locke, John Locke is famous for saying, I know not what. You know, and, and contemporary yeah. physicists are none the wiser. You know, sort of, I learned in school that physical objects are just mostly empty space. And mm -hmm. I was kind of curious to see what sort of the updated physics is on this. So when yeah. I wrote this, paper i was kind of reading into some theoretical physicists on you know what material objects are and one paper i i read on this i mean here's here's the characterization of a physical object according to one um, contemporary physicist macroscopic macroscopic objects like tables and cats are just peaks of high amplitude wave function that cluster around certain regions of configuration space Mm -hmm. Okay, now is that a very commonsensical view of what things like tables and cats are? <laughs> mm -hmm. No, but the question of whether or not our analysis of what a material object is, that's different from whether or not we accept the reality of material objects as they as they are given in appearance. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that's super helpful. Thanks for that. Um, the last version of idealism that we're going to consider here is dualistic idealism. Um, so tell us like what this is and like what do you think? Is it going to conflict with common sense? Yeah, so dualistic idealism, to understand this view, it's, it's helpful to understand it first by contrast, by considering its mirror opposite. A lot of philosophers of mind today think that the mind and its ideas are real and distinct from the physical brain. It's just that they, it's just that the mind and its ideas essentially depend on the physical brain. It's the mental is dependent on the physical. Uh, and uh, Jay Guan Kim has this famous book called Physicalism or Something Near Enough, where he argues that, uh, yeah, we can count as a physicalist view, the view that, yeah, there are these immaterial you know, ideas and minds, things like that, but they ultimately depend upon the physical brain. It's the, it's the brain that's really the more heavy lifting object here. That's giving, in some sense, it's giving rise to the mind or, or its ideas. It's, it's, uh, or the mind and its ideas supervene on the physical brain. Um, mm -hmm. well, 
dualistic idealism, idealism reverses this order, right? It, uh, it just says that the physical ultimately depends on the mental. So let me ask you, uh, Zach, there's a very widely held view. Uh, in fact, upwards of about 75 to 80 percent of the world's population maintain a version of this dualistic idealism as I've just described it. The physical ultimately depends on the mental. What would you think that view is? The, the physical, what's the view called? Like the view that the physical depends on the mental? Yeah, well, I mean, there, there's there's a view out there uh, that about 75 to 80 percent of the world's population mm -hmm. holds. Well, it sounds like theism. <laughs> it is theism. theism. <laughs> yeah. Thinking. Yeah, theism is a version of dualistic idealism, uh, mm -hmm. where the physical physical reality ultimately depends on the mental, namely God. And God is is spirit. Or God is just a a mind, an unembodied mind, and mm -hmm. all of physical reality ultimately depends on this this mind, and so it counts as a version of dualistic idealism. Um, and so I guess yeah. I, I hasten to say this is the easiest one, really. Uh, there's no real conflict here with common sense. Uh, it's not really the question we're, we're asking, but it's worth noting that some have argued that belief in God, theism, is itself a common sense belief in roughly the sense that we outlined. It's a belief that's deeply and widely held. Uh, it's taken to be a matter of common knowledge, and we form belief in God naturally and unreflectively uh, by our own properly functioning faculty. So if theism itself is a form, is a common sense belief, then this, this dualistic idealism is just not really in conflict with, with common sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's helpful. And I do like you talking about like, just bringing up like, um, like Christians, Muslims use, like we all believe typically if you believe in like creation, ex nihilo, like every like material thing out there, um, it all comes from our mind. So there's something there that we can have and like is, is an agreeing point that I think that's super helpful for bringing it up. Um, so anything else you want to say with regards to dualistic idealism? Yeah, so you might think there's just a little bit of squirreliness in the way we're defining terms here mm -hmm. and counting theism as a version of idealism. But what we're doing is just flipping the tables on the physicalist who's going to say, well, you know, my I acknowledge the existence, the reality of immaterial minds. It's just that they depend ultimately upon a uh, physical brain. And that's enough to count my view as as physicalist. Well, we're just saying the opposite. We're just saying. I acknowledge the reality of physical objects. It's just that they ultimately depend upon non-physical mind or 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 uh, uh, consciousness or soul or whatever you want to say. And mm -hmm. so, if that's if what you say is enough to count as a physicalist, what I say is enough to count as an idealist. Yeah, I think I think that's great, and it's helpful getting just like the mind matter just like thing because I think even like in conversations with like um, maybe like atheists or agnostics, like most people believe in minds. Most people believe in matter. Like what comes first, mind or matter? I think it kind of helps simplify um, that debate. And I think it's even more helpful than like a super natural, natural stuff sometimes. But I mm -hmm. think, it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So maybe then Chad, like what are your thoughts on idealism? Um, we talked about these three different views. Like, where do you think, like, do you think we talked about like, there is some teeth to it, but like, do you think it's true? Um, you, you wrote this paper and you've been thinking about it. What are your thoughts? What are you thinking on idealism right now? You know, I'm not really sure, but there is a really powerful argument for idealism that I don't know what to make of. Mm -hmm. It goes up. It goes like this: it, from a scientific perspective, things like colors, smells, flavors, textures, what Berkeley called sensible qualities, these are not features of things in themselves. Uh, these are just aspects of how we perceive things. These, mm -hmm. these, when we study things scientifically, all these things can just be eliminated. Now, the modern physical concept of an object ascribes nothing over and above geometrical properties and motions, which are merely extrinsic, relational, and purely formal properties, which say mm -hmm. nothing about what objects are in themselves intrinsically. So if we're just going on just purely scientific descriptions of objects, we have nothing that's not relational, extrinsic, and purely formal. There's nothing intrinsic to an object, but but it seems absurd to think that there's nothing intrinsic to an object, that there's nothing that a physical object is like in itself. But uh, uh, purely scientific descrip description, it's not 
going to get you what an object is like in itself. Uh, so if there is anything intrinsic to an object, an object in itself, if there are things in themselves, as you know, there's a famous uh, Kant's famous phrase, things in themselves, the best candidate is that it must be something mental or mind-like. Uh, since the, the the paradigmatic examples of intrinsicality, things in themselves, are, are mental things, things like feelings or, or phenomenal qualities in the mind. So if, if a purely scientific description of reality just can't get you uh, intrinsicality, it can't get you things in themselves, and it's absurd to think that there are no things in themselves, well, then a purely purely scientific description of reality is going to be radically incomplete. Mm. Uh, and what we need to fill it is going to be something mind-like. It's going to be like consciousness. It's going to be some sort of um, mental, uh, whatever you want to say. That's going to be what fills the gap. And, well, that's what idealism is. And that's one of one of uh, Berkeley's arguments for idealism. And, and obviously, there's an argument for theism lurking here, uh, just, just as is Bishop Berkeley thought. So I think this is a very powerful argument, but uh, it leads to kind of idealism. And, and as you say, I'm not, I don't, I don't know what to think, to be honest. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, sure. I mean, I'm an idealist insofar as the is, theism is a version of idealism, but that's kind of tongue in cheek. And maybe I can reconcile this argument with, with theism, a, sort of a banal version of theism, but um yeah, what, what, what do you make of that argument? Yeah, it's definitely interesting because thinking about it, like, I'm like, okay, if we have, like, if you think about, like, you read, like, a paper about, like, the bare bones, like, what an object is or something like that, like, it's missing a lot. Like, talking about, like, our experience of that object. Um, It's not just, like, oh, I saw um this thing in some sort of, like, with some, like, merely physical description. Like, there's things like color, sensations, um, the whole experiential aspect of seeing that thing go. So I think there's something there. And thinking about like, well, yeah, we can't just describe things purely from like, um, I don't want to say science because I don't, I don't want to be like out of the gaps, but there's something more than just like the bare bones, like scientific description of how an object works. Um, and it seems like it depends on our experience. So I think there's something there. I need to think about it more because I, I this is the first time I'm hearing this is you running by it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I like it. There's got to be, I'm just, what I've been imagining as you're going is like thinking about like a bowling ball flying through the air. Um, like you can write a bunch of equations like describing that bowling mm -hmm. ball um, and how it's flying in the air. But there's that actual experience of like seeing the bowling ball um, going through there. Like you can see it being like black or striped or whatever it is. Um, the sensation of it hitting you in the face, um, that would really hurt. It, it, you can't just like put that in like a mathematical like description. Um, so, yeah, I mean, there's something there. Well, yeah, everyone agrees that they're – well, maybe not everyone, but most people agree that – phenomenal experience is left out of a purely naturalistic or scientific explanation of reality. You know, this is one of the lessons of uh, Frank Jackson's Mary thought experiment. Mm -hmm. um, but the, what this argument is saying is that, you know, if you take, take like a blade of grass uh, and you say, well, what, what is a blade of grass? And you start describing it. It's like, well, it's kind of floppy. Well, that's, that's just a texture that you feel. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not going to be present in a scientific description of it. Well, it's green. Yeah. Well, green is just a wavelength. That's a that's just a wavelength of photons on on the color spectrum. You know, that's not going to be present in a purely scientific description of of what a blade of grass is. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's got these molecules, and then you go deeper down into like the molecular level, and well, the molecules themselves are just uh, relations of atoms moving and. And, and, and atoms themselves are just uh, relations of quarks and moving. And, you know, mm -hmm. you wind up, you keep referring to more extrinsic and relational and purely formal properties the more you try to get into the question of what a blade of grass is to where you just, you find that there is no blade of grass anymore. You're just talking about relations or you're not talking about anything in itself. Yeah. Uh, so, and that problem repeats all the way down to where, you just won't have anything unless you finally talk about something that's intrinsic, something in itself. And the best candidate we have of something that's intrinsic in itself is, is something is like a mind or, or, or a feeling or a thought or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah. it, it, and obviously, I mean, we can't, we, so yeah. So we're back, back on, back to idealism. And, and it just, at that point, you're just asking what version of idealism is true.
Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, I think it's like the up quark, the down quark, and there's something else. Um, it's like the three like fundamental parts of like the world, according to a lot of like modern, like physical theories, mm -hmm. if I'm right. Um, and it's like thinking like, is that it? Like, can these three things like explain like colors and sensations and um, things like that? And it's gonna be tricky. So yeah, I think that's, yeah, I think that's great. And it's something I need to think about more. And I'm sure I'm not fully getting it, but I'm just trying to um yeah spell it out and think about well, it well so, yeah, yeah. It, it gets even it gets even more deep when you look at you know the quantum realm and there's a lot coming out now where it seems like the deeper we go the more dependent on mind the subatomic realm is mm -hmm. uh you look at uh what's his name gordon i think is his last name he's doing some really interesting work here where he's arguing from basically modern quantum mechanics to I, an idealist view of, of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. There's definitely stuff there and it's going to be interesting how it all looks like 50 years from now. Um, but yeah, it's super interesting. And like, I know like the first time I watched a video on like double split experiment, I was just like, mm -hmm. what on earth is happening? This is crazy. Yeah. Like, this is like, I thought I'm like, this is literally idealism. And I know there's like responses and you know, all this stuff you can do, but like, um, like it just seems like surface level to me. Like when I look at these things, like at quantum mechanics, I'm like, well, that's just like idealism right there. So, mm. yeah. 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 And, and if you, I mean, that's much easier to make sense of on a theistic worldview than a naturalistic worldview to think that mind is somehow influencing reality at the subatomic level. <laughs> that's, that's, <laughs> that's really interesting stuff. Uh, Bruce Gordon is, is, is I think is okay. his name. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, is there a version of idealism you find most compelling, Chad? Um, we, obviously, it's definitely not an absolute idealism. We talked about that. Um, we have Berkeley, Berkeley and idealism, and we have dualistic idealism. Like, is there a version that you find most compelling? Well, I guess it would be Berkeley's because, you know, if we if we think about the example I just gave of the blade of grass, and we keep eliminating all of the sensible qualities from it trying to find what it is in itself and we just keep we and we we keep eliminating all all we're all we're encountering the further down we go is just more relational properties uh it's got to be it's absurd though to say that there's nothing there mm -hmm. but the, the only if the, and if the only thing we have to fill the gap is going to be something mind-like that's going to be god's mind and that's pretty much just berkeley's view but you know and i am attracted to the idea that what is to us physical creation is just an idea held in God's mind. Yeah. God, it's like God is so real, so much more real than us. His, his ideas constitute for us what is our most palpable reality. Yeah. It's like, um, well, I mean, think of it this way. There's a sense in which an actual rock is more real than my idea of a rock. But if an actual rock is more idea, uh, more real than my idea of a rock, then the actual rock is really nothing more than, and if and the actual rock is really nothing more than God's idea of it, mm -hmm. then God himself is more real than the actual rock. Uh, he, he's even more real than that. So, I mean, that's pretty real. How much more real can you get? Uh, I kind of like that idea that there are these degrees of reality that or like you know the strands here we have like a we have two degrees between you know us and our ideas and then there is like another level between god and his ideas and we are somewhere we, we are basically on the level of reality with god's ideas i kind of like that idea mm -hmm. but it gets into this degrees of reality stuff which is kind <laughs> of a slippery slope into uh classical theism and i am not a classical theist at all <laughs> Uh, so yeah. yeah, I mean, there are, there are versions of idealism that I'm, that I'm very tempted to, I like arguments for it, but it's still a lot to think about before I, I'm able to hitch, hitch my wagon there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's definitely trying to figure out like a model of God and understanding these things is super complex. Um, I do like Berkeley and idealism too, from like a simplicity standpoint, like if we could say like that everything exists is like God's mind and his mm -hmm. ideas, like, Ooh, that seems like a really simple view of like explaining yeah. everything. We don't need to like po posit a lot of stuff. Um, it seems like a very simple view, like even yeah. more simple than like dualistic idealism, but it has a lot more advantages than like absolute idealism. Cause we can still say that like we exist. It's a monistic view, it, it, meaning that there's just ultimately one kind of thing that exists in reality. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the most, that's the simplest kind of view that you could possibly have. So if there's, it's not like you have substances and properties. It's not like you have immaterial material or anything like that. 
yeah, you just got one kind of thing, and that's that's mind, God's mind. Uh, so it's it's an extremely simple view. So on theoretical grounds, yeah, that's that's a very powerful feature. Yeah, that's great. Um, anything else, Chad? You want to cover with regards to talking about like idealism and common sense before we start to wrap up here? Not really. Other than um, I want to give a shout out to uh, my late friend Ben Arbor. You know, he mm -hmm. was. Uh, he called himself an idealist and kind of in a cheeky way, you know, because I think his version of idealism, I think it was Berkeley. And actually he, he, he straight up thought Berkeley's views were right, but he liked to uh, really kind of poke the hornet's nest with when talking to other Christian philosophers by saying, well, you're an idealist, aren't you? And they would say, no. And he would say, well, don't you think that, everything physical ultimately depends on the mental. And they're like, well, yeah, that's just the is. And I was like, well, you're an idealist. So, <laughs> so uh, in conversation, <laughs> lots of conversations I've had with Ben is kind of what got me thinking about this topic. Uh, and uh, I started writing this chapter after uh, a phone call that I had with Ben uh, the, the night, the, the day he died. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I just kind of want to give a shout out uh, to, to my late friend, Ben Arbor for, getting me thinking seriously about this topic. It's amazing to see. Um, and I'm sure you'll see this continue with Ben, but like his legacy, even though he's passed, like it's continued to carry on and like his work's nowhere close to gone. Um, so yeah, it's great. Well, Chad, thank you so much for coming on today. And I don't really know how to close after that note. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for coming on and anything else you want to say with how people can like follow you or things like that to wrap things up here. So I've just started making a website. It's called, it's just camacintosh.com. It's still under under the sort of design stages, the production stages. But if you want to find my work, all my published work is is up there. All the interviews, uh, book reviews, and there's a section of the website that I'm currently building slowly and methodically on theistic arguments. So if you want to check that out, go ahead. Yeah, well, right on. Um, encourage everyone to check out Chad's website. Um, encourage everyone to check the paper um, Ideals and Common Sense. Really great stuff. And yeah, I hope you enjoy this conversation. Hope you find it edifying. Uh, if you're new here, I always encourage you to subscribe, leave a like, all that fun stuff. If you value our content, um, you can come to Patreon at patreon.com. So just here on projects. A little as a dollar a month, your support means a lot. Um, no new patrons to think since last time. But thank you so much, Chad, for coming on. Really enjoy this conversation. It's been so much fun. There's a lot of things to think about. Um, as I go to bed tonight, I'll look around and be like, <laughs> well, what is this like actually out here? Uh, so, yeah, thank you so much for coming on. I really appreciate it. Thanks a lot for having me, Zach. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Have a good one, and God bless. We'll see you next